Jago and Lightfoot, Series 3. It's the wet men! Lord save us! Shut up, Matthew Bright! Don't anger them! Can you not see? The future time is becoming clearer. Its noise is louder. The breaks are getting bigger. Both times will overlap shortly. Excellent. We step through the moment they do and shut it down. We can only step through when it is about to flood. We will have very little time. But of course, as usual. This will become louder and faster as the danger increases. The needle here points to the strongest of the breaks. The compass. Time is out of control. We are close to the time break. Something will happen, and it will happen here. So, are these two gents looking after you proper? They have been most attentive. Last night, Mr. Jago took us to the opera. Ooh, very posh. It was very strange. With much howling and wailing. Although the audience isn't actually supposed to join in. Hello and welcome YouTubers and Doctor Who fanatics to another Big Finish audio review and today I'm continuing my review series of the Jago and Lightfoot range with Jago and Lightfoot series 3 featuring Christopher Benjamin and Trevor Baxter playing their characters and of course Louise Jameson playing as Leela and joining our Infernal Investigators and this set features Dead Men's Tales by Justin Richards, The Man at the End of the Garden by Matthew Sweet Swan Song by John Dorney, and Chronoclasm by Andy Lane. So if you want to go straight to my review of Jago and Lightfoot Series 3 to the first story, and do want to see how this audio is presented, then there is the time on the bottom of the screen to the review. If you have or haven't skipped, then let's begin the video. For the front box art, we have Jago, Lightfoot, Mr. Payne, a Time Eater, Leela, and the Little Man, which is the villain from The Man at the End of the Garden. Then we have the wet men down by here, like the docks. A charge of electricity and a nice like green cover. And then we have the standard stuff from the worlds of Doctor Who, the Jago and Lightfoot logo. We've got some cogs in the background. Investigators of Infernal Incidents. And we have a gold banner of Series 3 and featuring the main cast of the Big Finish logo and this frame effect. For the top of the box set, we had the Jago and Lightfoot logo by there. And down on the bottom, the running time was 300 minutes of prox, including other bits of information, contact information, BBC logo and Big Finish logo. And for the side, what it looks like on your shelf, we have the Jago and Lightfoot logo again, and the Roman numeral for number three. And for the back of the box set, stars the main characters by here, and showcasing the four stories included in the set, and a short bio on each of them, which I'll place down in the description. And here we have the side of all the stories in the set, Dead Men's Tales, The Man at the End of the Garden, Swan Song and Chronoclasm. So that was the box set showcase, now I'm going to show you the individual stories which is in the set. The first story in the set is Dead Men's Tales, with the Jaguar and Lightfoot logo there, showcasing the main cast with a wet man and all of them down by here as well, and the docks in the background. Similar design to Series 2, but taking more of like a draw effect, as Series 2 is like paint, and now this one's like a draw effect. Some people don't like the Series 2, or 3, 4, and 5 covers, and they just prefer the simplicity of Series 1 to 6 to 10 covers. And then for the back, this is how it showcases, it says the name of the story, who is it written by, directed by, the bio and the story and the characters featured in the story and who played them. So inside we'll have the leaflet and the disc. If I take the disc out, it just shows the front cover again. And for the leaflet, if we open it up, we have the introduction from Justin Richards and a behind the scenes picture. And on the back, we have a character bio on the five main characters in the Jago and Lightfoot series. The second story is The Man at the End of the Garden by Matthew Sweet, Jago and Lightfoot logo with the garden here. And this very creepy man watching over the wall Probably my favourite cover as it's so striking. Then we have the back, just a different colour, showcase exactly the same as all of them. And then when we open it up, we are presented with the leaflet and the disc, and I forgot to mention the discs are like this dark and light green, just like the box art. And then for the leaflet, we have an introduction from Matthew Sweet, and behind the scenes picture. And also we have one on the back too, with Christopher Benjamin, Louise Jimison, and Trevor Baxter. Third story of the set, we have Swan Song by John Dorney with this ghost woman in a wheelchair and the theatre in the background. And then for the back of the cover, this is how it's showcased. And then for the leaflet, we have introduction by John Dorney, some of the cast, and then 
a nice picture by here, which I really like. And for the final story of the set, we have Chronoclasm by Andy Lane, with a time meter up front, two Jagos, and time bombs by here. With quite a nice pink vortex effect, and nice light coming out of the time meter's eyes. For the back, this is how Chronoclasm is showcased, with a shade of pink and purple. And when we open it up, we have two discs in this one, the story, and behind the scenes, and showcasing... Series 4, this is just really just a prototype and a draft copy of Series 4. And then for the leaflet, we have introduction from Andy Lane, behind the scenes picture, and the series credits. So that was Jake One Lightfoot Series 3 Showcase. Now moving into my review part of the video, starting with Dead Men's Tale by Justin Richards. Except there are so many different reported sightings. Sightings of what, bro? Wet men. The locals are calling him Wet Men. Now, to my review of Dead Men's Tales by Justin Richards, his third story from the range. He's been very impressive with The Blood of the Soldier and Lightfoot and Sanders. Very strong stories. This one has been rather mediocre with people. Some people saying it's a good story, and others saying it's just rather mediocre and doesn't live up with the other stories in the set. So that made me think, hmm, could go either way with me. Now to the summary of the entire box set, it continues from the cliffhanger from the roof and inheritance where Leela meets up with our infernal investigators Jago and Lightfoot for an important and vital mission set by the Time Lords, more specifically Romana. And Romana sent Leela as Leela knows this time very well as she's been to Victorian London before, the talents of Wen Chiang and knows Jago and Lightfoot. And Leela is sent as there are time cracks in Victorian London which are bringing unearthly forces and events which are happening from these time cracks and need to be contained and closed off. I have to say I'm a very big fan of this scenario of this box set. It did really get me excited. Anyway, for the summary of Dead Men's Tale story, which again, a cliffhanger for that is in the Riven Inheritance with the Wet Men, as time cracks are very close to the docks and it starts off the first villain being the Wet Man. So that was the opening summary to the entire series and Dead Man's Tales. Now to my in-depth review, then counters and performances, overall conclusion, then the next story, then ranking them from my least favourite to best, then do the overall verdict on the box set and then close off the video. And that's how I'll structure my box set reviews. So then let's move into my in-depth review of Dead Man's Tales. Yeah, Leela is quite well educated from her time in Gallifrey. I haven't heard her in the Gallifrey stories yet, but I think it would be quite similar what is here. And she's very well educated, knows quite a bit about time. She uses quite big words that she probably won't understand during her time in the TV series or the Fourth Doctor Adventures. But here she does, so it's nice to see Leela quite intelligent and knows what she is talking about. But still, she is quite like the savage, you know, likes being a hunter cannot resist a fight but still she doesn't understand things like human expressions very well so she's still very similar to the tv series just educated in places especially when she's talking about time so yeah i quite like that it's gonna be very interesting hearing her in the gallifrey series as i believe it would just be the exact same what's here now, ellie is going to be settling down during series three and i think it will be series four as well as she was a big focusing point ellie a bit in Series 1, but a hell of a lot in Series 2. She had a big thing to do in that one. So she's calming down a little bit. Leela's taking the front stage now. But don't worry, Ellie's got plenty of nice scenes, just not connected heavily to the story, neither the overarching scenario. Yeah, I have to admit, this is not one of Justin Richard's most creative stories. Nothing like Lightfoot and Sanders. So yeah, I would say the story isn't very creative to something with simplicity, something like Jay and Lightfoot and Strax really, as that is a very simplistic story, but that will be another day. But yeah, that's how I see it, just a simple story. Yeah, even though the story itself is rather simple, it does build up the actual big scenario of the set very well. As it seems to be a very big thing with these wet men, as mostly everyone knows about them and says, be careful of the wet man, don't let them take you all, and messages like that. So they feel like a big thing. So I like this slow build up to them as it feels like the tension can kick in with them. 
and they arrive when thunder and rain approaches, which is quite a nice thing as they are called wet men. Yeah, the story is quite fun in a lot of places, especially when they all disguise themselves. Yeah, Jago and Lightfoot disguise themselves to be pirates, that's pretty cool. I love Jago's expression of one. And Leela is pretending to be, I believe, a yeah, pub lady, that's it. So there you are, that's quite fun, that is, as Ellie teaches Leela how to be a pub lady. As why they're in the Jolly Roger disguise, as they're trying to find a time crack inside, and they can't just simply walk in. So yeah, they're in the Jolly Roger trying to find this apparent time crack inside. Yeah, that's definitely a very fun part of the story. Now, I just have a mention of a character called Mr. Payne, and he is left very ambiguous through the entire set until the last story. Yeah, he only really appears fully in that story. You just get mentions and references from him about this Dr. Payne. A very ambiguous character. And yeah, mentioned throughout the three stories quite a bit. And this is where Johnny Skipton, a very good supporting character, talks about Mr. Payne, that he will save him from the wet man. I do like the interactions between Leela and Ellie. I was looking forward to hearing that in this uh, set. It wasn't going on for too long, but I liked it, what was going on, as Ellie finds Leela a very interesting and a good person. About the three quarter mark through the story, we get the picture, the full picture of the wet men. And yeah, it's quite good at this. It's not a typical villain causing trouble. What they're doing is still quite scary, but I like it what they're doing and why. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention something about Ellie. It shows that Ellie is a very caring person during the end, which I really like. It's nice to see Ellie protect someone who is afraid, and Johnny Skipton is really afraid. And they think he's just afraid of the thunder and lightning, and they all laugh at him, but he's not afraid of that. But he knows that the wet men are coming to take him and kidnap him. So I like Ellie is so caring to people. So that's what you call her, love Ellie. She's so likeable. And I love Johnny Skipton's character during the end he's facing his fears and going against the wet man as he wanted to be free by dr pain but he went over his fears overcome his fears and just accepted it so that was really nice character writing that really shows bravery very well so i like that from justin richards the ending is a highlight of the series now two characters and performances jago and lightfoot didn't do anything special on the lines with the Blood the Soldier and Lightfoot and Sanders, keeping it rather simple this time, but nice dialogue, or great dialogue, between Leela. Next up is Leela, the great Louise Jameson. The character highlight for me, I loved her, shows how she changed from the TV series, The Fourth Doctor Adventures, to her time on Gallifrey. I really need to experience that range. And it's nice that Leela uses like big words and expressions and terms. Next person is Ellie by Lisa Bowerman. As I said, on the lighter side with Series 3, most likely the same thing with Series 4, but don't quote me on that. Not getting too much into the plot, but still got plenty of scenes, and I like how she's very caring to Johnny Skipton, who is afraid. And then last main character is Sergeant Quick. Not too much to do in this one, just scenes here and there. It's just really giving space for Lilo to do her thing and track down the time crack. And for supporting characters, we really only have two. The others are just background characters, the one from the Jolly Roger. Yeah, the ones I'll be covering is Johnny Skipton, a really nice supporting character, and the Wet Man. So yeah, Johnny Skipton, who is by Warren Brown, a great character, had a good part of the story, and I loved how he was really brave to overcome his fears. And then we have the Wet Man by Alex Mallison, a very good monster, not a typical Doctor Who monster. I love the why they're here, and yeah, the voicing of them are quite effective. So then, what is my final verdict on Dead Men's Tales? It's an underrated story. I very much enjoyed this one a lot. It's quite fun in places, and it has quite emotional writing during the end, where Johnny skipped him, goes over his fears. And it talks a lot about bravery, and I really like that. It's a nice highlight of the set. It builds up the main scenario of the box set very well. The story, on the simple side, yet I still really like what we've got here. On my first listen, I couldn't really 
get into this story, but on my second listen, I loved it a lot. I was fully engaged with it. And I give this one a 8 out of 10 for Dead Man's Tales. An underrated story in my opinion. Doesn't get the best of reviews, but I think it's a very good story. Still, I would admit it is a simple one, but yet good. That's a very short story, I think it runs for about 50 minutes, so it does fly by quite nicely. So that was my review of Dead Men's Tales, an 8 out of 10 it gets. Now to the next story of the set, The Man at the End of the Garden by Matthew Sweet. I am armed. I have warned you. Now, show yourself properly. Now to my review of The Man at the End of the Garden. Yeah, Matthew Sweet definitely has his own writing style being extremely odd. This is just different writing styles, and Matthew Sweet is just that acquired one. Now to the summary of The Man at the End of the Garden. is with this book called The Man at the End of the Garden, and once the book is being read, it seems to happen in real life to this little girl, and something lurking at the end of the garden. And yeah, Leela detects another crack, and I think you can guess where the time crack is, and it is another unearthly force. So that was the opening summary of The Man at the End of the Garden, now to my in-depth review. I'm going to say straight away that this is one of the most strangest stories I've ever listened to, especially for the Jager and Lightfoot range. As I said, he's an acquired taste, he does a lot of strange stories, very odd stories. So always expect that from a story by Matthew Sweet. Yeah, this story definitely has a unique way of story structuring. It's quite similar to Year of the Bats, for example, from series 10. Now, some of the scenes are these book scenes with the mother reading The Man at the End of the Garden to her child. And it keeps swapping the scenes from these book scenes to the actual story. She has quite an experimental one, as I said, something like Year of the Bats, for example quite unique storytelling. If you like the storytelling in Year of the Bats, chances are you would like it here. What I really like about the book scenes, it gets a bit disturbing and creepy when it goes along and it, it's joined with very chilling sound design when the mother is reading the book and you have this little man voice by Duncan Wisbley. And the book scenes are built up really well with the actual story with Jago and Life and integrated and embedded so well together. It doesn't feel jarring, neither disjointed in any way. It's really well embedded within the story, the book scenes. So I like how Matthew Sweet structured this story, it's really good. Yeah, Jago is the first one to get into this plot when speaking to a character who is Miss Hitch and this young girl being attacked in a room which is locked from the inside. So that's definitely where the interesting story telling starts off and Lightfoot and Quick are doing something else, working out the mystery of this box with breathing holes on it and blood on it. And yeah, they work out what it's used for. Lila takes a bit of time to get into this Man at the End of the Garden plot, but is trying to find an electrical device so she's doing something outside of the main plot. All the main characters are split up from the start of it, Jago doing one thing and then Lightfoot doing another. They soon get together in the actual plot. Lydia takes quite a bit of time. But yeah, Jago and Lightfoot's part of the story is definitely the most interesting part and the most detailed to the main plot, with the young girl being Clara. And yeah, there is a young girl voicing Clara in this story. Yeah, she was good what she was given. Yeah, when the story progresses, you can see the concept of the story, and that's where it gets pretty disturbing and creepy, where the book, what happens when the mother reads the book, actually happened. As when they go to the end of the garden, when they're in the garden and looking at the end of the garden, they can see blood on the tree, and all these crows or magpies, I can't remember which type of bird, are just watching them. Just completely still, but just staring at Jago and Lightfoot silently and not making a sound. And I find it very creepy when you picture it in your mind. Just magpies just watching you and not doing a thing. And it's joined together with pretty nice creepy music. The story about halfway through becomes a bit of an under siege story with these killer birds. Yet the same birds watching them from the tree. And now they're attacking the house trying to break in. 
It sort of reminds me of the cover from A Thousand Tiny Wings, as I know it has like killer pigeons in that. So that might be a similar element from A Thousand Tiny Wings in this story. So yeah, from the start, the story is pretty divided and they all join together in this Under Siege storytelling. And that's where Leela gets heavily into the plot. The twist during the end with Man of the End of the Garden is quite good. It's not outstanding, but it's good nonetheless. It's still unpredictable, I didn't see it coming, but yet it's not something original. However, that might be my little thing about it, my little niggle. Anyway, the story is very creative, very original, except at the end. And it's definitely a very unique one from the series, well actually I would say the entire range of Jager and Lightfoot being just very strange, different and unique, and I like that. Now two characters and performances with Jago and Lightfoot divided at the start where they all were the main characters. Then Jago and Lightfoot join in to the actual story when the Under Siege stage starts up. Yeah, Jago first was with Miss Hitch and Lightfoot was with Sergeant Quick trying to find out about this box with blood on it and breathing holes. Next up is Leela. About halfway through she enters the main plot. She's doing something else at the start of the story trying to find this electrical device. Quite interesting how she talks to the other characters such as Clara and Miss Hitch. Quite similar, like in Darkness of Glass, completely speaks on her mind whatever it is. I just don't think about the consequences at all. She's that strong and independent of a character. She will say whatever is on her mind. For the other two characters, we have Sergeant Quick and Ellie, just small scenes not in the plot. Um, Sergeant Quick is lightly in the plot with that box of blood on it, but that's about it. Now for supporting characters, we have Miss Hitch, which is Joanna Bacon. A good character, liked her part of the story with nice dialogue with the main characters, such as Leela for example. Next up is Clara, who is Eden Monatif. Yeah, she didn't do too bad playing the character, the Clara, the little girl in the story. The plot behind her is a big focus and works well, so yeah, well done to her. And then the last one who is called Mum, I can't remember her actual name and it's not listed on the back, and it is Joanna Monroe. And she is the one reading the book and I love those scenes as it gets a little bit more disturbing when the book scenes move along, very well integrated within the actual story. And then the little man which is Duncan Wisbley. The same guy who voices Saka, and I've been saying his name wrong for a very long time. I said Duquesne Wisbley, but it's Duncan, sorry. A great versatile voice actor, and I like him voicing this monster. Now, what is my final verdict on the man at the end of the garden? Well, it is certainly very strange and a very odd story. A very unique story from the series so far, and I think it will stand out to me. I am a massive fan of Matthew Sweet, I love his stories, The Magic Mouse Trap, You the Pig, and this one, I love him so much. But I will say it won't be for everyone, if you've listened to a Matthew Sweet story and you didn't like it, chances are you won't like any of his other stories as his ears and acquired taste. But I give Man at the End of the Garden a 9 out of 10. On my first listen it was a 9, and on my second is a 9 also, it hasn't changed whatsoever, and I still like it. So let's move on to the next story of the set. We have John Dorney entering the range with Swan Song. Henry. Hello. Uh, what? Henry. Could you hear that? Hear yeah, about Henry? <laughs> Nothing. Now to my review of Swan Song by John Dorney, who makes his introduction to the range. And yeah, this story looked pretty promising. A lot of people say it's a very fab story, and you do get the one person mentioning it's just quite mediocre. But yeah, mainly, it's a very loved story from Series 3. Some people say it's their favourite from the set. So yeah, to the summary of Swan Song, Lila tracks down another time crack, and this time it's at the new Regency Theatre, and that's the same theatre from the Theatre of Dreams, which is apparently haunted with a spirit in a wheelchair. And this is where the main scenario really kicks in now, and time is breaking up with 1890 and 2011 sliding into each other. So that was the opening summary of Swan Song. Now to my in-depth review. It's got quite a nice introduction or pre-title sequence and really does build up the main plot and the entire set. With time really now breaking up and this time crack forming up with 1890 and 2011 breaking into each other. 
and a ghost in the theatre, which is talking to Jago and messages of the end of the world. So really nice pre-title sequence. Yeah, this story doesn't feature neither Sergeant Quick or Ellie, and they're completely out of the story. It's just the main cast, Jago, Lightfoot, and Leela. And Jago at the start seems to be the only one connecting to the ghost plot with him seeing this person, which Lightfoot and Leela haven't noticed. Yeah, this story feels very trapped and contained when they're in the theatre, and it's only really just three places. The theatre, the New Regency Theatre in 1890, the time cracks in the middle where Jago sometimes appears in, and then 2011 with these time experiments. So it's really three locations, and yet it feels very trapped and contained. The best thing about Swan Song is it's got superior and very creepy sound design. I really like the sound design in this one. I would say it's the best thing about Swan Song. It's just got really nice sound design. And it plays the sound design when they can faintly see the crack of 2011. And the characters in 2011 is Alice, Dan and Stephen. And Alice thinks there are ghosts but... Dan thinking a bit more sensible, as he doesn't believe in ghosts. He's thinking it's just time leakage. Yeah, the ghost voice is pretty chilling with the voice saying Henry, and it gets more demonic each time it says it. And it does sort of creep out Jago as he's the only one who can hear it. It's a nice creepy concept with time, as it's just talking to Jago and no one else. And yeah, Jago ends up in a completely different place, this is where the time cracks come into play, where he can see two other people fighting. Now this gets really interesting, especially for the build-up of the ambiguous Mr. Payne. And in 2011, Stephen gets a phone call from Mr. Payne, and he was mentioned in 1890s in Dead Man's Tale, so mm, very interesting. Got a nice build-up to him. It is a very unusual build-up to a villain, quite different as he's left ambiguous for the entire set until the very end. Dr. Todd was left a mystery, not ambiguous, but we know a little bit about him and get hints about him. But Mr. Payne, he's very unpredictable, especially in the last story. And Gabriel Sanders, well, he had a completely different build-up. He was right from the gecko in Life Threat and Sanders. As I said, he's mentioned throughout the entire stories with the first three stories and then makes his ultimate move in the last story. Yeah, I won't talk about Mr. Payne just yet, that'll be in Chronoclasm. I'm covering a little bit more with the time breach scenes, I'm not going to go heavily detailed into this, as it's something to experience for yourself. As one of the time breach scenes, they can see their future and their ultimate death. If it's either a time leak, an ultimate death, they don't know because time is going all over the place. As they can see themselves, Jago and Lightfoot being killed, in a building collapsing. So yeah, there's more than one time breaks in this Regency theater. And yeah, what's well, really good, but Jago Life and, and Leela enter 2011. It's quite good to see Jago and Lightfoot in this time with all these time experiments and this future technology which they don't know of. And this does explain why there are so many time cracks forming up. And something quite big with Alice's character and this is where John Donnelly gets quite emotional and some nice twists. Yeah, the final scene does reveal some quite nice twists with the time cracks with Alice, which does actually sadden Jago. Now two characters and performances, Jago and Lightfoot first. Jago is the first one to get into the ghost plot with the ghost saying Henry over and over again. And very interesting how Jago recognises Alice, who's from 2011. Very interesting. And yeah, Lightfoot and Leela quickly get into the plot also. It's all set in really three different locations. Regency Theatre, The Time Cracks, and then 2011. Next up is Leela. And yes, sounding extremely educated in this one. Using really big, long words and terms in this one. sounds, And using very complex explanations about time. So yeah, I like that. Leela being very educated. And it shows it a lot in this one. Now for supporting characters, we have Alice, who is Abigail Hollick. Quite the centre of attention in this story, hence why she's on the cover. And you can tell she's going to play a big part of this one, as the pre-title sequence sort of links to that. And yeah, she has a big thing of the main plot. 
and you got some nice twists and turns and nice writing during the end. And for the other two, we have Dan and Stefan, Hailey Morgan and Andrew Westfield. Not huge focusing characters, but Stefan had a sort of um, nice scene where he was on the phone talking to Mr. Payne. And then I'll briefly talk about Mr. Payne in this one, which is Philip Bretherton. He does show himself, but yet he's still left ambiguous. As he is a very unpredictable where his character leans towards. As he's a lot different from Dr. Top and Gabriel Sanders, a lot different. But he is shown to be the villain of the story, but we don't know why he's doing that. That's the big question, and the nice twist. So then, what is my final verdict on Swan Song? Yeah, it's a good story, this one is. It's got some fantastic sound design. It sounds very strange, creepy, and odd, which does explain time very well. I don't think this story is as good on my second listen, in my opinion. It does build up the main plot very well with the time cracks, Mr. Payne and the main villains, the Time Eaters. But I don't think it's one of the strongest J1 Lightfoot stories in my opinion, but I still like it. So then that was Swan Song by John Dorney. Next up is Chronoclasm by Andy Lang. Have you connected the equipment up yet? The electrical cells are cabled in, but I have not yet tested the stability of the connections. Well, hurry it up. I haven't got much time. Although, in another sense, I have all the time in the world. So here we have Chronoclasm, the final story of the set. Now, I really wanted Andy Lane to push it up now, as the Roof and Inheritance was... Yeah, sort of a letdown. It was a good story, but not how I wanted Series 2 to end, because Series 2 was so unbelievably good. All the three stories at the start were, like, over nines. It was an incredible boxer. I know Andy Lane can do much better, as The Mahogany Murderers is a fantastic pilot episode with a 9 out of 10. As Series 3 has been built up very good with the main villains, Dr. Payne and the Time Crack, so it would be a big letdown if the story doesn't live up to my expectations. Now to the summary of the story, it starts off with these gold spheres landing in Lightfoot's house, and the roof is not even damaged or no sign of it actually crashing in the house. And it came from a place with no time, and what is being said from Leela's time device, so it's something completely unknown. And now we get the full picture of Mr. Payne and then the Time Eaters, what they're up to. So that was the opening summary of Chronoclasm, now to my in-depth review. Yeah, the build-up to Dr. Payne is, in is really good, left ambiguous, you really want to know who this guy is. And... I would have hated it if it did a roof and inheritance where it takes almost halfway through the story as we haven't got a lot of pain action yet. We just want to know who he is. And he gets into the story very quickly, talking to this character, Nikola Tesla. You should recognise that name. So yeah, it's a good thing we have Mr. Payne very fast. Yeah, Leela's time device is still detecting more time cracks. And yeah, Andy Lane has a big opportunity to branch out is writing as time has been affected with things coming from the past and the future which is crashing in Victorian London such as it starts off with a TV which is talking about the BBC News so I was liking the look of this story as it looks like Andy Lane had a lot of stuff to work with and it would work in this story as time is being affected so you can have things like a fighter jet in it coming from the future things like that so we had a lot of things to work with, Andy Lane, so I was looking very impressed with this one. Sarge Quick actually says a really funny line in this one, which was um, referencing the gold spirals landing in his house, and he says, Lightfoot, been doing some nighttime decorating, have you? And Lightfoot really hates that, as his room is completely trashed, and I just love how Quick just says that. So yeah, Sergeant Quick was pretty funny in this story, and I like that. Yeah, the story is divided with Lightfoot, Quick and Ellie in the house trying to find out where Payne's location is. And then we have Jago and Leela seeing all this future breaking up. With now they have a World War I aircraft now, which is opening fire on Jago and Leela. But Series 3 not only builds up Chronoclasm, but it also builds up Series 4 with a bigger threat coming and Mr. Dark. Yeah, we get more scenes with Payne and Tesla, as Payne does 
speak down to him that he is nothing compared to himself. And he talks about the true threat. And then we get a picture of what these god spirals are. As I said, they're time bombs. Do we get an idea of what pain and the time eaters are up to? Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, there's two Jagos on this cover. Yeah, there is literally two Jagos in this story. The present Jago and the future Jago. And it's really fun hearing these two Jagos interact with each other. In the last couple of scenes with Pain reminds me of Pyramids of Mars with like traps and codes to get to him. It's going to be like a big challenge to get to Mr. Pain. And yeah, Pain, as I said, he's a very interesting foe when he's approached by the main characters. To explain Mr. Pain, he's like a very intimidating business boss manager sort of character. Think of him like that. And this is where we find the intentions of Mr. Pain, and this is where it gets very unpredictable, which I do like. His intentions are malicious, he's still going to be doing something really bad. The way I can sort of put this, he's doing a bad thing to reach a good conclusion, if that makes any sense. You will know what I'm talking about if you listen to Chronoclasm. He's doing something bad which will, in the end, do something good. Yeah, he's not necessarily a villain like Dr. Tulp or Sanders. And yeah, the story concludes with the plot of Series 3, the main villains and Mr. Payne. And we don't really know what happens to him, he might have died, went back to his own time, the same fate as Nikola Tesla, we don't really know what happened to him. So I like that, we don't know what happened to Mr. Payne. Now to characters and performances, we have Jago and Lightfoot, great fun, especially Jago, the two Jagos, interacting with each other, that's great, and interacting with Pain. Next up is Leela, and we know she is in Series 4, as something's gone wrong with her time device, which has prevented her to leave. And it definitely has great build-up to Series 4 with Leela during the end. Next is Sergeant Quick and Ellie. Quite funny in this story, especially with the dialogue of Lightfoot and Quick, with his house being destroyed with the gold spheres. Ellie is also quite funny, not joining into the plot too much, but still good. Next up we have Payne, a very complex character when you learn his intentions of why he is doing this. Next up is Nikola Tesla, Duncan, Wisbley. Good scenes with Mr. Payne and playing some parts during the end and scenes. And then the Time Eaters, which is Wendy Pabry, and there was someone else. Is it Alex Madison? No, it's John O. Monroe. Yeah, quite good monsters, nothing special, but it links well with Mr. Payne. So then, what is my final verdict on Chronoclasm? Very positive, and a much improvement over his Series 2 finale. It ends very high, and seriously builds up Professor Cordius Dark in Series 4 very well, and Series 4 as a whole with a bigger threat coming, and this is just a fantastic finale. And I give it a 9 out of 10. Well done to Andy Lane, you've redeemed yourself. So that was my review of each of the stories. Now I'm going to do a recap with the rankings. Fourth place is John Dorney's Swan Song. This was first place tying with Man at the End of the Garden. I was not sure which one to go with. So yeah, it changed quite a lot on my second go. Yeah, I say it is a good, a very good story by John Dorney, but in my opinion, it's the weakest out of the set. It did set up Chronoclasm very well, and with Alice's story was very emotional and very good with the time cracks and all that. In my opinion, it is the weakest out of the set for me. Third place, it is the underrated Dead Men's Tales. You know, it gets things like 5 out of 10, 6 out of 10, and the odd 8 out of 10. And yeah, I'm one of those odd people, I give it an 8 out of 10. A truly underrated story, I find it a lot of fun in places. Sets up the main scenario very well. A simple story, yet it works. Characters are brilliant, and it shows bravery very well. Especially with Johnny Skipton's character. A very good highlight of Series 3. Yeah, very good story. An underrated one from the Jake and Lightfoot range. Second place, it is Matthew Sweet's The Man at the End of the Garden. A very odd and strange story, but definitely unique out of the set. And I love Matthew Sweet's stories. And it is quite creepy and disturbing with the book scenes. And yeah, that's Man at the End of the Garden with a 9 out of 10. Didn't change too much. 
And in first place, we have the very creative and brilliant finale, Chronochasm, with Mr. Payne, really good character, the Time Eaters, and overall, this ends the box set really well. This was third place with an 8 out of 10 on my first listen. On second listen, it's my favourite out of the set. I love it. So then, what is my final verdict on the box set? Well, it is absolutely fantastic. No surprise there. The stories are all really good, fantastic. And I just love this range. It's one of my favourite Big Finish ranges, and I cannot wait to get Series 4. I'm dying for it, as the cliffhanger really builds up Series 4 so well. And for a box set rating, I give it an 8.5 out of 10. It's going to be very likely, but all the box sets will be an 8 or higher, absolutely, because this range is so brilliant. And Series 3 is a really good box set, as it does give us a wider range of stories. Series 1 and 2 were rather similar to each other, yet brilliant. But this is when the stories are more wider, and then connecting to each other, so branching out the stories. So thank you very much for watching my review of Jago and Lightfoot Series 3. I hope you enjoyed the review. Goodbye. And have a good one.